Welcome to Hamilton at War, our 12-part weekly podcast series that brings to life in vivid historical and emotional detail Alexander Hamilton's Revolutionary War Service. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy this latest installment. Hamilton at War, written by Robert Child and narrated by James Gillis. On the road to Morristown. Several weeks after the victories at Trenton and Princeton, in early January 1777, Generals Washington and Green rode on horseback at a slow pace, leading their column of troops deeper into New Jersey. The victorious army was moving to winter quarters. Washington said, I have decided to increase my staff at Morristown, yet I have no time to vet candidates. Do you know of any suitable ones, General? Green, riding opposite Washington, replied, Well, you could not go wrong with Major Wilkins, sir, of our second Rhode Islanders. Pausing, remembering, Green added, Although he does have a nervous tick which annoys. Washington raised an eyebrow. Have you considered Captain Hamilton of the New York Artillery? Washington's face revealed that he had not. He fights well, Washington conceded. He's much more than an accomplished artilleryman, sir. I became acquainted with him in our encampment at Harlem Heights, sharp mind and an even sharper pen. I wanted him to join my staff, but his desire was to remain in the field. Washington was intrigued. I had been reading his brilliant political essays in the New York Journal for months, written under a pseudonym, before I discovered our young captain was the author. Washington's face showed recognition of reading those same essays. Green frowned, looking into the distance and attempted to recall a passage from one of Hamilton's essays. What was it that stays with me? He paused. Ah, yes. The rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as if with a sunbeam in the volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity itself, and can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. Washington nodded to Green. I'll pen a note to him. Morristown, New Jersey February 1777 Hamilton rode alone on a chestnut horse under grey winter skies across the American camp with a broad smile on his face. He arrived at a two-storey clapboard tavern on the town green owned by Jacob Arnold, which served as army headquarters. Hamilton dismounted and tied the reins of his horse to a post at the front, then entered the tavern. Looking lost, he encountered one of Washington's aides, Captain Hamilton, to see His Excellency. The aide nodded and went to announce his arrival. Adjutant Reed arrived in short order. Reed said, So good to see you, sir, and may I be the first to welcome you to headquarters. His Excellency will be down directly. The tavern buzzed with activity. Aides, as well as locals and even some dogs, scurried in and out. Hamilton took a seat near the fire. After ten minutes, Washington arrived. Hamilton stood immediately at attention and saluted. Our captain, I was delighted to learn of your favourable response. Welcome to our humble and exceedingly cramped quarters. I am honoured, Your Excellency. I will endeavour to make myself as useful in your service as exertion allows. Washington sized him up. I am on my way to survey the encampment, sir. Won't you accompany me? Hamilton jumped at the opportunity. Indeed, sir, it would be my distinct honour. The men exited the tavern, mounted their horses, and rode off towards the stark New Jersey hills. Hamilton revelled being in Washington's shadow as they slowly surveyed the camp. Washington rode, returning salutes occasionally. General Green informs me that you are the accomplished essayist who penned many of the articles I enjoyed in the journal. Hamilton, blushing, downplayed his notoriety, only simple writings of an impassioned collegian for my adopted country. So you're not from New York? 
No, Your Excellency, I hail from the West Indies. Washington continued to probe. And so what was it about our cause that inspired your patriotism? Hamilton, not missing a beat, responded, Freedom. The freedom of men to make their own way, establish their own selves, hindered neither by birth nor the rule of a tyrant. En saint croix I was doomed to my birth station. In America, merit and ambition will determine my future. Washington saw that Hamilton indeed had a grasp of the nature of their fight. As an immigrant, you seem to see clearly the promise of America, the promise of mankind, Hamilton replied in an energized tone. Washington nodded to him to go on. As a boy, the ugliness of human nature, intolerance, slavery, and vice surrounded me. Self-interest, not public virtue, was the passion which ruled. Man will always be self-interested. Quite true, Your Excellency. But in America there exists the notion of the common good of all. Men will not logically, on that account, be enemies of a new form of government that affords them protection, liberty, and the right to pursue their own self-interest, their own dreams. Washington turned to Hamilton in his saddle. Well said, Lieutenant Colonel. Well said. To which Hamilton smiled. It was his first time hearing himself addressed by his new rank. Do you have family here in America? No, Your Excellency, I became orphaned very young. The army is my family. Washington looked to Hamilton with a mixture of sympathy and protectiveness. He had chosen his new aid well. The men rode on, deeper into the camp. Colonial Home, Morristown, New Jersey, Spring 1777 Lovely, vivacious Katie Green, wife of General Green, was throwing a spring dinner party. Washington's aides in blue and buff uniforms lined the table. Washington and Green were not present. Laughter flowed easily, as Katie playfully pried into Hamilton's personal life. And you, Colonel Hamilton, what qualities do you fancy in the fairer sex? Beautiful women flanked Hamilton at the table. One girl, nineteen-year-old, dark-eyed, pretty, thin-faced Elizabeth Schuyler, paid him close attention. She had been born into one of the richest and most influential families in the entire state of New York. Hamilton responded to Katie's question in the same playful manner. Although war prevents me from considering matrimonial affairs, it has allowed me time to define my ideal. Elizabeth leaned closer. Hamilton then commenced flirting in the language of the time. First and foremost, she must reserve me the right to treat her as a goddess, a Venus for whose deification I would cull from every poet of my acquaintance the choicest delicacies to lay at the feet of her goddess's shrine. Katie's eyes widened, and the other women swooned. Then a late dinner guest arrived at the party. A fifty-year-old grey-haired servant entered to announce his arrival. Colonel John Lawrence has arrived, madam. Aristocratic, twenty-three-year-old, strikingly handsome, blue-eyed John Lawrence entered the room with a flourish. The women at the table audibly gasped. Hamilton noted their reactions. John, at last, Katie said, welcoming him to the dinner. Lawrence rushed to Katie, lifted her hand, and planted a delicate kiss. Vous devenez plus jolie chaque jour, Madame Green. You grow lovelier by the day, Mrs. Green. Katie rose and introduced Lawrence. Le colonel. Vos mots touchent mon cœur. Colonel, your words touch my heart. Everyone, this is Colonel John Lawrence of South Carolina, an old family friend, and the only person who indulges my schoolgirl French. Lawrence turned to the group. A pleasure to meet you all. Come, John, join our table, Katie said, motioning to a chair. Hamilton followed Lawrence admiringly. He seemed the very ideal of a man, one Hamilton himself could emulate. 
Lawrence took his place opposite Hamilton. Hamilton, not wanting to be shown up, employed his fluent French. Le colonel, le français et la langue de roman, vous ne diriez pas? Colonel, French is the language of romance, wouldn't you say? Laughter began as Lawrence nodded his head in agreement. Hamilton's French was perfect. C'est juste, c'est la langue d'amour. Eh, de guerre, monsieur. True, it is the language of love and war, sir. Hamilton was bursting to respond with another volley, but Katie broke in, Enough, gentlemen! Your skills are duly noted. Then she coyly added, And admired. Lawrence and Hamilton bowed their heads to one another. The jousting, called a draw, was complete. A sultry May moon brightened the way as two figures walked along a path. It was Hamilton and Elizabeth getting better acquainted after the dinner party. Your French is very impressive, Colonel. Where did you learn to speak so fluently? In the West Indies, where I was raised. Oh. How was it growing up on an island? I wish I could say I had fond memories from my youth. But they are few. And when did you arrive in America? Just four years ago. I attended King's College on a scholarship and remained when hostilities erupted. Elizabeth smiled. So you patriotically answered the call of your adopted country? Yes. My fervour for the American cause and its justness ignited a fire within my person and within my pen. So you are a writer, Colonel? Probed Elizabeth, intrigued. I make no claims upon Mr. Payne. Yet I found I could not restrain my voice. I joined the army to seal, very likely with my blood, the sentiments defended by my pen. You sound as if you believe your fate is not to survive the war. Be it so, if heaven decree it. I was born to die, and my reason and conscience tell me it is impossible to die in a more glorious or important cause. Elizabeth was struck by Hamilton's eloquence and passion for the American cause. She leaned closer. You inspire, Colonel Hamilton. Please, call me Alex. Elizabeth smiled sweetly. And you can call me Eliza. All my friends do. Hamilton now smiled, and Eliza blushed. And so I will. Eliza, if I may be so bold to ask, may I write to you? Elizabeth smiled broadly. You may indeed, sir. You may indeed. She drew in even closer as they continued down the moonlit path. Chesapeake Bay The British general, aristocratic, confident Sir William Howe, 48, and his massive flotilla of 260 ships containing 17,000 men sailed into Upper Chesapeake Bay. It was August 1777. Howe's massive fleet had anchored at Head of Elk, Maryland. Three hundred flatboats approached the beach. Howe, with his staff, stepped onto the beach from his just-landed flagship and took in the British-American landscape. Ah, Maryland, he said as he breathed deeply, then looked to a nearby aide and only forty miles from Philadelphia. How then turned around to take in the sight of his massive armada and embarking troops. Soon we shall have their capital. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening. I'm Robert Child, and be with us next week for another exciting installment of Hamilton at War, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.